Hello everyone, my name is Evi Palato from geoengineer.org. I am pleased to introduce you to April's 2016 online lecture organized by the International Society for Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. This month, Professor Ovinet will be talking about geotechnical challenges in Mexico City clay. Gabriel Ovinet Guichard is a civil engineer by École Spéciale de Travaux, Publics de Paris. He got his doctorate in engineering degree from Facultad de Ingenieria. Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, UNAM. He is a researcher at Instituto de Ingeniería and professor in the Master and Doctorate Program in Engineering of UNAM. He has been president of the Mexican Society for Soil Mechanics 1991 until 1992 and vice president for North American for the International Society for Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering between 2009 until 2013. He currently heads the Geoinformatics Laboratory of Instituto de Ingeniería UNAM. Note that after the completion of the webinar, Professor Ovenet will be happy to answer any question posted on the ISSMG question and answer platform. The platform will remain active for two days. It is located between the present video and you may access it with your GeoWorld account. Enjoy the lecture! Welcome to this webinar lecture on geotechnical challenges in Mexico City clay. I would like to thank ISSMG board and in particular Professor Paul Main, Vice President for North America, for their invitation to deliver this lecture. I am Gabriel Ovine, Professor at Instituto Ingenieria Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, that is Institute of Engineering, National University of Mexico. Professor Carl Terzaghi used to say that Mexico City was the paradise of soil mechanics. I have been working for almost 50 years in this very special geotechnical environment, and I would rather say that for us, geotechnical engineers in Mexico City, it looks frequently more like hell than paradise. Mexico Basin is located within the neovolcanic transversal range that goes from west to east across the central part of the country. The geological context is 100% volcanic. Mexico City Basin was originally an open valley, draining towards the south. This valley was closed by volcanic eruptions that gave birth to the Chichi Nautzin Range, which formed a natural dam. Shallow lakes were formed that were progressively filled by aeolian materials, mainly volcanic ashes, produced by the eruptions of nearby large volcanoes of the Sierra Nevada, mainly Popocatépetl and Ixtasiwat. Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, was founded during the 14th century on a small island. In 1520, the Spanish conquistadors decided to build the capital of the new Spain on the same island as Tenochtitlan, as shown as this painting by Gómez de Trasmonte in 1628. The city was protected against flooding by a dike, but it was affected anyway by recurrent flooding. The capital remained flooded during a four-year period from 1629 to 1633. It was deemed necessary to build a drainage tunnel that was finally substituted by a large cut, the Nochistongo Trench, to control the water level in the lakes. This is a view of Nochistongo Trench that was terminated in 1789 after two centuries of intensive work to perform an excavation up to 50 meters deep. 
this paranoid work was not sufficient to protect the city. At the end of the 19th century, a new channel, the Grand Canal, was built to conduct the water to a new tunnel, the Tekiskiak Tunnel. This is the entrance of the Tekisiak Tunnel in the northern part of Mexico City. This new drainage system was inaugurated in 1900. Soon, the lakes were practica practically dried and only some channels were left as witnesses of the lacustrine past of the city. Mexico City urban area kept growing on the lake sediments of the valley and became the huge metropolis that exists now with a population of more than 20 million inhabitants. Let us now focus our attention on the special properties of Mexico City clay. The lacustrine sediment on which a large part of the city is built consists mainly of very soft clays as can be observed in the open pit shown in on the slide. This material can be described as a heterogeneous volcanic lacustrine clay. It is a complex mixture of clay and non clay minerals with microorganisms, dissolved salts, and organic components. The presence of microfossils, such as diatoms and ostracodes, is key to explain some of the special properties of Mexico City clay including its very high water content. This slide shows a soil profile in the lacustrine zone of Mexico City. Typically, a dried material layer is found in the surface overlaying the thick upper clay formation. A few silty and sandy lenses are found within the clay, but the first really hard layer, about 2 meters thick, is found at a depth of about 30 meters. A second clay formation, 5 to 10 meters thick, with a lower water content, is then found. The deeper layers, less relevant from the geotechnical engineering point of view, are simply called deep deposits. Again, this would be a typical soil profile in the lake zone. We can see the high water content in the upper clay formation, the low CPT resistance, SPT blow count close to zero, high compressibility, and low endurance strength. Water table is found at a depth of about one meter. Typical index and mechanical properties for Mexico City clay are indicated on this slide. The void ratio ranges from 5 to 10, porosity 0.83 to 0.9. Water content varies between 220 and 420, but uh, uh, larger values as high as 700% are not uncommon. Liquid limit is between 110 and 458%. Plastic limit 37 to 116%. Plastic index 73 to 342%. Thermability of the order of 10 minus 7 centimeters per second. And uh, we observe the high value of the compressibility index, CC, that ranges between 3 and 8. The undrate modulus is about 4,000 to 7,000 kPa. 
And uh, the under end shear strength uh, ranges between 15 and 35 kPa. This is a sensitive material, so sensitivity about 8. And uh, we have a surprising uh, high value of the internal friction angle that uh, in drain test between 34 and 41 degrees. The shear wave velocity is generally less than 100 meters per second. Here we can see uh, this uh, surprising results regarding the internal angle of friction. Uh, we can see that uh, the internal angle of friction uh, reaches value as high as 41 degrees. A number of elastoplastic models have been developed to describe the behavior of Mexico City clay. Some of them uh, are accounting for anisotropy, such as the model developed by Wheeler, shown in the slide. After the 1985 earthquake, an ambitious program to study the cyclic and dynamic properties of Mexico City clays was developed in the field and the laboratory. The clay was tested in resonant column devices and cyclic simple shear and triaxial devices. In the field, a large number of downhole and suspension PS logging tests had been performed. Shear modulus of Mexico City clays remains pretty constant in a wide range of angular strain. In the same way, damping remains low for shear strengths as high as 0.1%. The large quantity of data available can be taken advantage of to uh, assess the spatial variation of the soil properties within Mexico City Valley. A geotechnical database containing the results of about 10,000 boreholes has been formed and incorporated in a geographical information system. This is an aspect of the geographical information system. This GIS can be consulted to obtain geotechnical data for specific sites, including soil profiles in boreholes performed in the same area. The information available on the south of the city can be visual, visual, visualized on these slides. For interpolation of data between boreholes, the mathematical form formalism of uh, random fields is commonly used. The random variation of soil properties within the clay formations are considered as random field with their expected value, variance, autocorrelation function, covariance, and correlation coefficient. As a matter of fact, it should be taken into account that uh, the, these random fields are also variable with time due to the, the subsidence phenomenon that we will refer to later. In this slide, you can see the evolution of properties due to regional uh, consolidation. And uh, we see that uh, between two different dates, in that case 1952 and 1986, we notice uh, 
substantial variation of the thickness of the clay layer, but also of the water content, of the volumetric weight, and uh, uh, the compression strength. To perform conditional estimation and uh, to estimate and uh, simulate the, the spatial variation of soil properties, techniques inspired in geostatistics are used. So we perform conditional estimation or conditional simulation to obtain values of uh, properties in site where no boreholes has been performed. This is an example. In that case, the variable studies is the depth of the first hard layer, considered as a random function. Based on the boreholes performed in the area, it is possible to obtain the contours of the depth of this layer using geotechnical statistics such as uh, simple krieging or ordinary krieging. The configuration of the first hard layer was assessed using geostatistical estimation and uh, the results are presented on this slide. We can see that uh, this hard layer presents a general slope, but also a depression shown in the red circle. Uh, this depression has a very simple explanation. It corresponds to the deformation induced in the hard layer by the weight of the Metropolitan the Cathedral. Many natural and anthropic anomalies can be detected within the lacustrine zone. Most correspond to the island dikes and floating gardens that existed during the Aztec Empire. The main anomaly is, of course, the Tenochtitlan Island, where a 12-meter thick man-made field has been detected. Of course, this island is not no longer visible. It disappeared below the central downtown of the, of the city. A model for the subsoil for the downtown area has been built. The contours of the field have been defined. and are shown is in this model. We see that uh, the field reach a maximum value uh, below the Metropolitan Cathedral that reaches about 12 meters. On the top of this model, a representation of the large uneven settlement of the surface due to clay consolidation and that the weight of the construction has been superimposed. Using geostatistical estimation techniques, virtual boreholes and subsoil cross section can be obtained, such as this section showing uh, the variation of water content from west to east. We can see that the, the clay formation is not really homogeneous, but is constituted by uh, substrata uh, 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 with different water content. This uh, subsoil cross section can be combined from 3D models. These models are very useful for preliminary geotechnical designs. This slide shows the 3D model of the east part of the lacustrine zone. This is the site where new, the new Mexico City Airport 
is being built. The geotechnical data have also been useful to define the geotechnical zoning of Mexico City to be included in the building code of the city. A new geotechnical zoning has been proposed recently. The metropolitan area is divided in three geotechnical zones, the lake zone in blue, the transition, transition zone in yellow, and the hill zone. The borders between these different areas are constantly evaluated, taking into account new available data. The geotechnical zoning is the main support also for the definition of the seismic zoning. The depth of the deep deposits has also been assessed, an important feature for seismic analysis. One of the main factors to be taken into account in geotechnical analysis and design is the general subsidence that affects the lake zone. The subsidence of the city was detected at the beginning of the 20th century. It was initially attributed to the weight of the construction, but Dr. Navocarillo clearly established in 1947 that it was a consequence of water pressure drawdown due to pumping of water from the deep aquifers below the city. This slide shows the location of the well, initially artesian wells, existing in Mexico City. This slide shows the subsidence of three points within the downtown area. The rate of subsidence has been a function of the policy adopted for the operation of the well in the city. This simplified finite element model shows how the pumping of water from a previous aquifer below the clay formation induces subsidence. The subsidence has formed a ball-like depression in the lake area. One of the most conspicuous evidence of the subsidence is the apparent protruding of the casing of old wells in the city as shown on the slide. You can see, for example, in the case of this casing, that uh, in 1950, we had uh, the original surface. Sorry, and in 1950, the casing had already protruded several meters with respect to the original surface in 1907 and uh, in 2007 we can see that uh, it has protruded a total of 7.23. It should be of course understood that uh, the well casing is not moving, the soil is going, going down. Deep shafts of the drainage system have also been protruding. A map of accumulated subsidence has been established. In some area, the subsidence exists, exceeds 13 meters.
the subsidence rates reach this value as high as 40 centimeters per year in the red area as shown on the slide. New remote techniques such as interference techniques like INSAR and LIDAR are being used to measure the subsidence. Another problem that must be dealt with in geotechnical engineering is the site effect during earthquakes. Accelerograms registered on hard rock and on soft clay during the September 19, 1995 earthquake can be compared on these slides. A large amplification and changes in the frequency content are observed. This effect was known before the earthquake, as seen in this paper by Seed and Rosenblut, but its potential consequences had not been properly assessed. The phenomenon can be adequately reproduced using unidimensional amplification models. The dominant period is seen to vary according to the thickness and properties of the subsoil, the subsoil within the valley. It should be expected that in the future the seismic response will be greatly affected by the evolution of the thickness, thickness and stiffness of the clay layers due to subsidence. It is a study performed by uh, Dr. Efrain Ovando that shows that the peak acceleration will move toward the left as uh, shown for year 2047 on the slide. Another challenge for geotechnical engineers in Mexico City is the problem of soil uh, fissuring. In the lake zone, deep cracks have been seen to appear in the soil, especially at the beginning of the rainy season. This type of cracks seems to be a consequence of hydraulic fracturing due to superficial impounding of water during the rainy season and can be modeled using fracture mechanics. These cracks tend to become apparent during earthquakes. Another type of cracks with a step, as shown on the slide, is observed in transition areas at the perimeter of the lake zone. Those are the more destructive cracks. The same simplified element, finite element model uh, shown before can be used to illustrate the interaction that develops between the subsiding soft soil and the firm soil or rocks surrounding the lake area. The red zone is affected by tension stresses that induce fracturing. Cracks must be stabilized, stabilized to avoid that they take uncontrollable dimensions due to erosion, especially during the rainy season. A geographical information system containing information on cracks and their evolution has also been developed.
Maps showing the distribution of the main tracks are constantly updated with the new information available. As a matter of fact, this study has been extended to other valley contiguous to other valleys contiguous to Mexico City Valley and presenting similar problems, such as the Coatitlan and Toluca valleys. In spite of the works, works performed in the past, the drainage of the city is still a very serious matter. Flooding of parts of the city is a recurrent problem. The drainage through the Grand Canal has lost most of its efficiency due to the slope changes induced by the general subsidence of the lake zone. We can see on the slide that uh, to keep using the Grand Canal, pumping stations have been built in a different point along the the, this canal uh, and uh, that leads to tunnel of Tikiskiak. A new deep drainage system had to be built consisting of tunnels down to a depth of up to 200 meters. This, this is the first system, the Sistema de Drenaje Profundo, that was built between 1967 and 1975. The construction of this tunnel in soft soil has been performed using tunnel boring machines with slurry shields or based in the principle of off-pressure balance. This is a view of the outlet of Emisor Central, the, the main component of the deep drainage system inaugurated in 1975. Depending on a unique tunnel for drainage has been considered as unreliable. In the case of failure of this outlet, a general flooding of Mexico City downtown could occur in only a few months, as shown on this slide. It has thus been decided to build a new tunnel, Tunnel Emisor Oriente. This is a 62 kilometer long tunnel with a diameter of seven meters, probably is the largest tunnel being built in the world in soil uh, in soft soil and uh, alluvial soils. It will be completed in 2018. Other connecting tunnels are also being built. Here we see one of the tunnel boring machines. This is one of the shafts of the system. Different construction techniques are used to build these shafts, going from traditional system to cast-in-place walls or innovative techniques such as the flotation method. This is one of the machines used to uh, Excavate panels for casting place walls in the construction of shafts for the tunnel emissor of the end. In this difficult geotechnical context, design of foundation is also a real challenge. Large 
and uneven settlement were already observed in the pre-Hispanic period, as shown here with the remains of the Templo Mayor, the main pyramid of the Aztecs in Mexico City. Some of the monuments built during the New Spain period also presented large settlement. This is the case of the Santissima Church with settlement exceeding two meters. The Metropolitan Cathedral presented differential settlement of more than two meters. The geometry of this large monument was partially restored using the subexcavation technique, the same technique that was subsequently used for the Pisa Tower in Italy. Soil was extracted from below the Metropolitan Cathedral to induce a settlement leading to the correction of the geometry of the building. Foundation of buildings in Mexico City can consist of surficial or compensated system for light construction or deep foundation on point-bearing piles for high-rise buildings. Point-bearing foundation tend, however, to protrude with respect to the surrounding ground and are affected by negative skin friction. For intermediate construction, friction piles can be a better solution but they have been found to be vulnerable to seismic solicitations. The independence column is a well-known example of a protruding pile bearing foundation. The behavior of deep foundation can be modeled using numerical and analytical models where concepts such as the neutral level and the negative skin friction are taken into account. This is a model that was developed by Resendis and Ovine in the 70s and is still used. It is a 3D model that can compete with uh, finite element analysis. However, uh, in recent uh, design and analysis are generally performed using the finite element method, 3D, 3D uh, finite element method. New foundation techniques are also, have also been introduced. One of them consists in using rigid inclusions for controlling settlement. These are cast-in-place unreinforced piles without structural connection to the building. New construction techniques are used to guarantee good quality of the inclusions. This technique has proven to be an effective and economical solution for medium-rise medium -rise buildings for which seismic action are not critical. Finally, I would like to say a few words of the geotechnical challenges raised by the construction and operation of transport system such as a subway system of Mexico City. Some of the 13 subway lines have been severely affected by the subsidence, especially in the case of subway lines crossing areas with different types of subsoil, as shown in, on this slide for the line A. Uh, we see that this line crosses lacustrine areas, but also hills constituted by quite different materials and of course we have very large longitudinal differential settlement up to 8 meters and uh, 
and damages induced by differential settlement in transition zone. In the zones, frequent and costly maintenance work are necessary to correct the large deformation induced in the structure. A new line was built recently in the same geotechnical condition and unfortunately similar difficulties should be expected. This concludes my presentation. It has been a pleasure to share with you some of the fascinating problems that geotechnical engineers must deal with in Mexico City. From a professional point of view, we can conclude that after all, Probably Terzaghi was right to assert that Mexico City is soil mechanics paradise. I will be glad to try to give an answer to your questions. Thank you very much.